Welcome to Dedicated. I'm your host, Doug Brunt. Today we're having one of our special episodes of Dedicated where we have video in addition to the audio. And one of the reasons we're doing that is we have the awesome Mike Rowe with us here today. Mm. Mike is living out his maxim that hard work and fun are two sides of the same coin. You might know him as host of Dirty Jobs on the Discovery Channel or from the show Somebody's Gotta Do It mm -hmm. or from The Deadliest Catch or from his smash hit podcast, The Way I Heard It. Or perhaps from his appearance on Sesame Street, where he declared that Oscar does indeed have the dirtiest job. He's also the best-selling author of the book, The Way I Heard It, same title as his podcast. And we'll talk more about that book in detail later, because I am obsessed with it. It's full of life wisdom, and it you takes read these... It? Oh, I, it's dog-eared and underlined, and you must sign it for me later, oh, please, when we're, when we're good and drunk. Okay. But it Perfect. takes these incredible, mind-blowing pieces of history, and it's so well-written, because each one ends in this twist that you don't see coming that sort of unveils at the end. I, I lost track of the number of times I went into the next room to find my wife to say, honey, you won't believe this. <laughs> but he's an incredible talent. I'm thrilled he's here with us today. Mike, welcome. Thanks, Doug. Very kind of you. And I'd be remiss if I didn't also thank you for coming on to the aforementioned podcast to discuss a terrific book about diesel. Oh. Man, my, my dad loves it, and he made sure that I told you uh, hello, and thank you for being so smart. Oh, well, thank you. Then uh, it was great to have you on. And just as a quick side note, you clearly have reach throughout the country because I got so many emails and uh, messages inbound saying, I heard you on Mike Rose's show. You know, I bought the book, love the book. So thank That's you great. for having me on. And, you know, as long as we're just blowing sunshine at each other, <laughs> thank you for doing this in person. Um, I've just really started to commit to that on my podcast. And it's mm -hmm. so much more satisfying than Zoom or Riverside or whatever it was we had to do you know i mean it was convenient during the lockdowns but you know in life this is far superior you know it's i, I almost always do it in person and i think in the beginning because i'm just a little baby interviewer i over the foot you have the skills to do it any which way you can make it sing remotely or in person but for me it really is helpful to do it in person especially because i like to make a cocktail and uh having remote cocktails is is never as good now for the audio only crowd i usually go heavy on the sure on of course. Voice. And as you do this, just let me point out of the of the many shows I've pitched over the years, but but failed to sell. Uh, my favorite is called Drinking with Geniuses. And if I have my way before the dust settles, I'm going to wind up in an interview format like this with a guy like you <laughs> in a dive bar. Uh, somehow getting away with making a TV show fueled mostly by bourbon. It's a dream I have. I would like to be a guest on that show. And speaking of bourbon, would you mind mm. giving us the backstory on Noble Whiskey here? Uh, I'd be honored. Uh, what you're making, I assume, is going to be a Noble Old Fashioned. Uh, Manhattan. Or, oh, Manhattan. Oh, Manhattan. Better still, because okay. here we are in Manhattan. Um, <laughs> yeah, Noble uh, is whiskey made in Tennessee. It's spelled K-N-O-B-E-L, just like my granddad's last name, Carl Noble, to whom Dirty Jobs was dedicated, and the uh, foundation that sprung out of it, called Microworks, started as a fundraiser a couple years ago. A friend of a friend had some five-year-old juice in the barrel. Um, and it became available through a set of circumstances, not entirely relevant. But it's weird, Doug, to have access to five-year-old bourbon. Like, you can't just go, I think I'll start a line of bourbon tomorrow, right? Get, right? And then you're five years out. You're five years out. But all of a sudden, we had this whiskey, and my friend said, look, you should come to Tennessee and try it. Because if you like it, and I think you will, you might have a chance to do something cool. Now you Eddie, can see the constraints I'm under here. Like this is not I, your normal. I don't know bar how you could have made this set. harder. There's no, there's no workable <laughs> table. You're a grown man in a faux leather chair, scooping out what maraschino cherries. That's right. Oh, speaking of which, if this company doesn't like do a product placement on this show at some point soon, Luxardo Cherry is the way. It's the best. May I? Manhattan Cherry, yes. Luxardo Cherries is the way. <laughs> if you're having a Manhattan in Manhattan with another writer, Luxardo. Or go home. That, I mean, the years at QVC have, have paid off. That's like... You can't shake it, man. Magic. I, mean, I can't. I'm not proud of it, but, you know, <laughs> when you can't escape your past, you might as well embrace it. Now, I made an enormous amount here in case <laughs> we, are, we go fast. <laughs> well, I, in full disclosure, my business partner, Mary Sullivan, is here. Would she like one? Well, Mary, she, would you like... 
She's as Irish as her last name implies, which means her liver is the size of uh, a bus. And so, yeah, she would probably enjoy one. No, uh, really? No? Are you All sure, shot? Mike? Can we get a, one more glass? I know we'll be yeah. here for that. So I think there's a, a glass on the I way. I mean, she's probably full of tequila from lunch, but <laughs> whatever. <laughs> hey, we're, we're bringing back the, the martini lunch. Mm -hmm. Mike, there you go. Thank you very much. Cheers. Great to see you in person in Manhattan. You too, Doug. Cheers. Cheers. Look at that. Oh, my goodness. Ah, the noble. The noble whiskey. Shazam. So I was wondering if it was noble or Nobel, but it is noble. It's noble, like Carl Noble. He had um, two daughters, no sons, and I think his name pretty much died with him. And so during the lockdowns, there was talk about uh, bringing dirty jobs back because it was such an essential work you know, yeah. a love letter. And so we did it. And to try and bring some attention to that, as well as raise some money for my foundation, we got the stuff in a bottle and we started selling it. And then the reviews came in and it, they were very flattering. Mm -hmm. So Mary pulled me aside and was like, hey, you know, don't be an idiot. Let's uh, get some more. And so now back up front here by the book. Oh, thank you. Product placement. Yeah. So we got rye and we got uh, the Rick House edition, which we're enjoying. We got the original juice and we've got some barrel strength, which will both put the hair on <laughs> and take the hair off of your chest. That's like that Jack Carr whiskey. I, I was a 121 proof or something insane. I was you got to get that. me um, his email. Yeah. Uh, Jack has been on my podcast and I don't have his contact, but he sent a, he sent me a bottle after that oh yeah it's like warrior proof uh, i think it's yeah, called warrior proof right yeah I'll, I'll, I'll send Lord. you guys a put us on a text chain after the show i mean it's good it's yeah. good i mean it's better he's than noble that's not for me to say but it's good folks it, it he's a great guy too he is so uh grew up around the baltimore area i did and i read from your book that very happy childhood maybe modest means or so to very modest but also really like super blessed with parents who were diabolical in the way they could create the illusion of prosperity mm -hmm. where, where there was none. And more importantly, um, my grandparents lived next door. We were on a little hilltop in Baltimore County. There was nobody else around. We had about 50 acres of dense wood behind the pasture where my mother kept the horses that my granddad, you know, they built the, the stable and the barn. And we had a stream called uh, Stemmer's Run, a covered bridge. And then on the other side, the highway, 95 came in and they, they had an off ramp about 300 yards down a hill that was filled with these uh, pine trees. And so as a kid, my, my mother told us that it was the ocean because she's an inveterate <laughs> liar, you know, and well, I just believed her. And so I thought for the longest time I was living in some kind of like Middle Earth sort of weird annex. I mean, mm -hmm. I had no sense that we were only four miles from the city line. It was woods. Yeah. And horses and chores and the sound of an ocean that was really a highway. I love that bit in your book where, you, you know, some kids you would know, they'd, they'd gone on some expensive family vacation and your, <laughs> your parents would be like, oh, those poor people who don't have this wonderful backyard of their own that they need to travel to some distant place to enjoy themselves. That was the, uh, yeah, the, um, God, the, these neighbors came over with all these photos of like Yellowstone and stuff. And it just looked fabulous. And my parents could see my brothers and I looking at him going, God, you know, we've never been any place like that. <laughs> and as soon as they leave, it's like, oh, those poor bastards. Those poor wretches. They got to get on a plane and fly to God knows where when we could just walk right down the lane and there are the deer <laughs> and the foxes and the horses. and Well you know. played, Mom and Dad, until you turn like 12 and realize, like, wait a minute. Well, they did it with everything, <laughs> Doug. It was like clothing, right? We didn't have any mo money for new clothes, but I had these giant cousins, Stephen and Gary, who outgrew everything, and they passed it down to us. But it wasn't just hand-me-downs. It was, isn't it great, John, the way the boys have access to clothes that are already broken in? You know, isn't it nice that they don't have to walk the around? The patches look so good. <laughs> and, and my buddies, like, you know, they would get carry-out food, and they'd talk about, you know, pizzas and Chinese food delivered to their homes. And, you know, the old man would be like, 
God, isn't it a shame that Bobby's mother can't cook? Oh, it is, John, it is. But we shouldn't make fun of them, you know. Not everybody can enjoy a meatloaf casserole on a Thursday. So I was also reading the book. I learned a lot about you in the book as well as, you know, many places online. The book is a great way. We'll, we'll get to the book, but you tie in these historical things, and each one then gives you, like, your ties it to a life experience of your own where we, we end up learning a lot about you as well. But in se- the late 70s or so, you became an Eagle Scout, which is kind of late. Like, you were 17 when mm-hmm. you became an Eagle Scout. I I don't really know how that works. It seems late to me. I think most 17s are out, like, robbing the liquor store already. But you must have been a good guy. You were doing the Eagle Scouts No, then. I was robbing the liquor stores at 11 and 12. And as part <laughs> of my <laughs> penance, they put me in the Boy Scouts. No, I was... Uh, the Boy Scouts saved me, honestly. I was so you were not on the straight and narrow earlier. No, I was very straight and very narrow. And I had a stutter, and I was shy, and I didn't like meeting people. And the sound of the do- my mom tells a story today. She loves it. She's like, when the doorbell used to ring, when Michael was like six or seven, he would dive under the, dive under the table or hide in the closet. Like the prospect of meeting new people was not my thing. Mm-hmm. I hated it. Mm-hmm. And so really to, to kind of cure me of that horrible shyness, my, my father put me in the station wagon one afternoon the one with the fake wood on the side. Oh, yeah, we had those. Drove me to uh, Kenwood United Presbyterian Church and literally pushed me out, I think, while we were still moving. And I went to my first troop meeting, uh, Troop 16. And, uh, you know, it was not a... It was not a safe space in those days. Uh, the, the, Boy the Presbyterian Scout. Church and the, well, and the Boy I mean, Scouts? The, the church was never safe, but the Boy Scouts was run by a guy. The Scoutmaster was a retired lieutenant colonel, and he, and he ran the troop like a platoon, and there was discipline, and there was a boxing ring, and there were shooting lessons, archery lessons. There were rapids. There was lots of uncomfortableness, you know, yeah. and, of course, merit badges, merit you know i mean what a concept and so it 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 was part gang part platoon with uniforms and badges (laughs) and and awards and i took to it i was gonna say you thrived you became the eagle scout by uh by 17 i did i did and then you know to my shame well maybe not shame but i i did that and i and then i put it behind me because you know for a while at first, it was very uncool, and then it was super cool because. Did you it, learn survival skills out in the woods and yeah. camping and stuff like that? Yeah. Because I, I joke with my wife if the things if things ever hit the fan, I would be one of the first to go. I don't know how to do anything, and well, she she looks at me. She's like, "You've never looked less attractive right now." Like, <laughs> yeah, but you know <laughs> I what? Find to, someone else. My advice is if if you're going to take that position, and it and it's not ignoble, right? I mean, you have to ask yourself, especially in the wake of shows like um, The Walking Dead. You know, do you really want to survive? Right, right. I mean, do you really want to survive the apocalypse and go shoulder to shoulder for the rest of your life with the zombies? I, I, mm-hmm. I don't. I mean, I guess maybe with kids and stuff, and you know, but you know, you don't just want to survive. You want to yeah. find a way to thrive. That's, I, mean, I think there's a line of that that book uh, by Emily St. John Mandel, Station Eleven. It's like you know, we've come all this way, and for what? For you what? Know, what it's, exactly. Survival is not enough. I think is like the thing, the tattoo they all get in the. the That's movie. it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. If you're like thriving is very different than surviving. Yeah. And so when you talk about survival skills, they're only really sensible in the service of getting you to a place where you're doing something other than starting fires with sticks and living in a tree, mm-hmm. you know, unless that's really how you want to spend the next 30. You mentioned your stutter. That, that came up a couple times in the book as well. And, uh, you know, John, there are a number of people who've really succeeded in TV and other places Who've had childhood stutters, like John Stossel had a stutter. Yeah. Yep, and I know he's done some events with Emily Blunt, the actress who had a stutter, and yeah. So I, I and you overcame it in some ways through your drama teacher. It sounds like. Well, I didn't. I should be clear. There are a lot of ways to stammer, and some of it is, is there a difference between stutter and stammer. I think so. And I had a stammer, and it was a weird little hitch, and it was brought on by a combination of uh, nervousness and the letter T. T's were trouble and and i i learned that in the fifth grade when the teacher we were in some sort of geography class and they asked for the for the capital of kansas and i knew it was topeka and i raised my hand and she said michael and what came out was and finally i just screw it i said salinas now 
I realized in that moment I'd rather be wrong than continue to stammer through and mm-hmm. get it right. And mm-hmm. that's when I thought, now nah, this this is something I should I should deal with. But it wasn't a physiological problem, and I it's not a like a it was an eye opener for me because it stuck with me until the tenth grade. And I had a music teacher named Fred King in high school who was, you read or saw Mr. Holland's opus, I take it? Saw. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this guy took me by the scruff of the neck, metaphorically, and just said, not not this way, this way. Mm -hmm. Do this, not that. He made music interesting to me, and it hadn't been before. He made drama interesting. And he did it in part because he was such a man's man. I mean, he was a, a football player, a Golden Glove boxer, who would look you square in the face and sing God Bless America and weep as he did it. He also didn't have any teeth. They all got knocked out <laughs> fighting and playing football. And he had these dentures that he would constantly take out and do weird stuff with. Like he had, he had these joke dentures that he would wear, dozens of different pairs of them. He was interesting in ways that teachers today really aren't and wildly politically incorrect and and profoundly inappropriate. And one of the things he did for me, one of the many things, was he insisted that I audition for a play. And and he had already helped me with my stammer because, of course, you can't stammer when you sing. Mm Mm-hmm. And so I could carry a tune. So is that really like as long as you're singing, it doesn't happen? Sure. And I would reference Mel Tillis to your listeners, a famous country western singer who couldn't get a sentence out. I mean, Mel was mm-hmm. full on Porky Pig, right? And but when he sang, just a big, beautiful. Yeah, it's like that voice. scene in the King's Speech. It right, very with, much uh, like it. Colin Firth. Yeah. What a great movie that was. Yeah, that was that terrific. Was great. Anyhow, Fred insisted that I audition and I, I memorized a, uh, a monologue and I walked out on the stage and he and a dozen other teachers and maybe a dozen kids were out there waiting their turn to audition. And I got 20 seconds into this monologue and um, I'm stammering and just making a hash of it like I knew I would. And Fred stopped me. He was about four rows back in the audience and he said, Mikey, I love, I love what you're doing with the character but this character doesn't stutter. So do me a favor. <laughs> do that humming a humming a crap on your own time. Just try it once without all that. And at that point, I know how glib that sounds, but I trusted him mm-hmm. and I just did it. And 20 seconds in, you had, st- that's amazing. And he looked at me and he, and he like gave me a shrug and a tilt of the head as if to say, Hey, wouldn't life be interesting if maybe uh, you just didn't stutter unless you felt like it, in which case, that's on your own time. And it was a literal click, Doug. It was a like, oh, oh, if I can, if I can act like somebody who doesn't stutter, then maybe, maybe what else can I do? And so all sorts of possibilities opened up in that moment. And I started to think differently about really everything. That's, it's like, so as you say, sort of getting into a role, I know my, my wife is as a lawyer, she'll get nervous, you know, back when she was a lawyer. And uh, she would say, I just had to like sort of put on a different uniform. Like I'd get my lawyer and it, this isn't me. This isn't me at risk out there. It's this character I've become. Kind of the same idea. You can almost sort of slip out of the, the reality of it. Aren't you always a lawyer, like a Marine? <laughs> Once a lawyer. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, do you ever truly recover? I think I, she's just enjoying exercising those same muscles in different ways, I think, now. It's yeah. so true, you know? I mean, like a lot of people, I watch your wife do her thing and I've, I've watched her transition you know, through these various things. And, and when I enjoy her most, it's when she's being completely transparent. I mean, it feels like we're seeing her authentic F-bomb dropping self, mm-hmm. but still. I should see her in the kitchen. It's like, <laughs> can't even imagine. <laughs> That's when the F-bombs go flying. Can't even imagine. <laughs> but there's still the lawyer. There's yeah. still, there's something always there that leaves me feeling like she can look at both sides of a thing at yeah. the same time. Right, right. I mean, they say with the first job of a of a defense attorney is to prepare, prepare the prosecution's case, and then you go back and do yours. So she can really, she has that knack for being able to argue both sides. The beauty, and I don't know what the state of rhetoric and debate is in higher ed today, but when I took rhetoric and persuasion and then debate, the thing I most loved about it was that you didn't know what side of the resolution you were going to defend mm-hmm. 
until right before. Yeah, it just gets assigned to you right before. Yeah. You had to prepare both, you know, and I, I, I think as skills go, I mean, you know, whether you're a writer or a, or a mason or whatever, I mean, that's a, that's a handy thing to have yeah. and something that seems in fairly short supply these days. So next in my little page of notes here is your phenomenal, as we all know by now, you have this incredible voice for radio, for the shows that you do, but it also, as is not the case for everyone, translates to a beautiful singing voice. And in 2017, you became an honorary lifetime member of the Barbershop Harmony Society. That's true. As you that, mentioned some singing in high school, so you've always been singing. You've always sort of, some, some teacher somewhere recognized this guy can sing. Well, I mean, here's, here's the theme circling back. That was Fred King. Mm -hmm. Fred King was the, I mean, there's an old magazine. You can find him on the cover of it. I think it was like in the Baltimore Sunday Sun. And the title is King of the Barbershoppers. And here's this guy with three other dudes in a quartet called the Oriole Four that won the International Barbershop Championship of the World. Now, a lot of your listeners probably don't even know that, like, like there's a square dancing community out there, right? <laughs> there's a crochet. There's a Christopher Guest movie for any one of these things, right? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, that is so completely true. But for barbershop, it's on steroids. I mean, barbershop is, as a musical form, really about as Americana as it gets. I think maybe jazz and barbershop are the only true forms of uniquely, uniquely American Fred music. Came from here, yeah. Yep. And Fred King was a master of it. He could sing any part. He could arrange any song. And in that world... Why, why is it called barbershop? Like... Well, because it originated in barbershops. Men would congregate in barbershops. And as they got their hair cut and stood around and waited to get their hair cut... They would sing the old songs. Huh. And, you know, around the turn of the century, the last century, songs did a different kind of work than the top 40 does today. They were impossibly maudlin and, and deeply, unapologetically and aggressively sentimental. They were written, in many cases, to try and channel a level of grief that can barely be spoken. There were songs about crib death you know fingerprints mm -hmm. was a famous song in i think 1909 about a guy who walks into the nursery where the baby once had lain and he's been devastated by this terrible terrible death and the sunlight comes through the window and backlit on the pane are the fingerprints that he kisses away and somebody sets this to music and then it's sung far and wide because people didn't know what to do with their mm -hmm. with their grief? It's like the ancient traditions, you know. It's it is campfire stuff. It's yeah. it's 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 storytelling in in such a raw form, you know. Mm -hmm. The little boy who Santa Claus forgot. Can you imagine this song? Christmas comes but once a year for every girl and boy. The laughter and the joys they find in each new toy. I'll tell you of a little boy who lives across the way. This little fellow's Christmas is just another day. He's the little boy who Santa Claus forgot. And goodness knows he didn't want a lot. He sent a note to Santa for some soldiers and a drum. It broke his little heart when he found Santa hadn't come. In the street, he envies all those lucky boys and wanders home to last year's broken toys. I'm so sorry for that laddie. He hasn't got a daddy. He's the little boy who Santa Claus forgot. Imagine hundreds of songs like that. Mm -hmm. Imagine your high school music teacher teaching them to you and three of your best friends. You're 17, 18 years old. You're now singing songs that no one has ever heard of that were written to assuage a level of guilt mm -hmm. or and, and grief that you can't imagine. And now you're going to nursing homes and you're singing them. You're singing them. <laughs> for you're getting paid $20. That's mm -hmm. what I was doing with Fred King. That's mm -hmm. how I got into the world of barbershop. And Fred was the conductor of a chorus called the Chorus of the Chesapeake that consisted of 200 men, most of whom had fought in the Second World War or the Korean War. Mm -hmm. And Doug, I can't even, I swear I'm not exaggerating. We would go to these rehearsals with these impossibly manly men 
who would sing these impossibly sentimental songs, and we would learn them. And then after rehearsal, we would go to a bar called Johnny Jones, and we would sit around these square tables with National Bohemian beer and pretzels, and they would teach us the old songs. Mm -hmm. And that's how we learned them, just by, by ear. And then we would <clears throat> sing them, you know, and that get better amazing. at them. My, my dad was a World War II era guy, and he knew a thousand songs. He, because that's what they did in his high school and in college. When, when their college fraternity got together, they would get together in a room. I mean, I, it makes me laugh to think about it now, but they would get together in a room and sing songs. I'm like, that's what you would do when you got together? And today, imagine, I mean, I compare that to how my kids are coming up today. And we're, we actually, I think, are on the side of the spectrum that is among the least amount of handheld device, iPad. Our kids aren't on any social media app at all, but they do have a phone. But I mean, no one's getting, no, four kids aren't getting together and singing songs now. They're getting together and they're not barely talking. They're, they're communicating through a device, even though the other kids are four feet away. Each other. Yeah. yeah, they go out to dinner and they take out their phones. Yeah, and they nobody each nobody other knows pictures. the words to a song, really, unless it's like one they're following was, on Instagram. I mean, I, 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 I don't want to overstate it, but it was the greatest gift to, to have of a seat, to be 17 and 18 and to see the greatest generation. Um, sitting around a square table singing a song you'd never heard of many of these guys they would they wept as they mm -hmm. sang they they would sing songs about god there was a song called um <laughs> i they're so sad i laugh you know i think there's a chapter in a book called sad songs because i mean they're still for sale very much but not like this mm -hmm. and i i remember a uh, a table, four men, all in their 70s, all who had lost their wives, they're all widowers, singing a song called Dear Old Girl, The Robin Sings Above You. Dear Old Girl, it speaks of how I love you. The blinding tears are falling as I think of my lost pearl, and my lonely heart is calling, mm. calling for you, dear old girl. Can you imagine, like, it... It was so sad, but also so cathartic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a 17-year-old, you get to make sense or try to make sense out of, out of that. Mm -hmm. But then the next song is Roses of Picardy, which your dad would have known from the war. And then on and on it went. And so as a boy, I spent Tuesday nights drinking beer. I was too young to order, <laughs> watching old men sing sad songs mm -hmm. in Highland Town. And... Um, I didn't think of it this way at the time, but that's that's a writing class. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, so you you develop even more muscles. You you've got the singing. You've dropped the stammer behind. You finish up college. You get a job at QVC, which I was thinking of when I was reading about you. It was almost like boot camp for TV. You were getting paid to get hours and hours <laughs> to work your TV muscles. I mean, how many talk about getting your ten thousand hours in? I mean, this was like boot camp. That's exactly what it was. Yeah, I was uh, singing in the opera at the time, which was another weird tangent. But I, I got into the Baltimore Opera, and one day during an intermission, dressed as a Viking, I walked across <laughs> the street to watch the part of the football game. And uh, I knew the bartender, and the game wasn't on. He was watching a big guy in a shiny suit sell pots and pans. Mm -hmm. This would have been 1989. I was like, Rick, what? Put on the game. He's like, I, I'm, I'm trying to prepare because I'm going to audition tomorrow for this channel. And that was the first time I saw a, a home shopping channel. And obviously, my, it was, well, that's, that's it, man. That's the end of Western civilization as we know it. It's a 24 <laughs> hour commercial. But as I was watching it, I, I mean, you know, ego aside, my second thought was, I, th I think I could do that, maybe. Mm -hmm. So, we made a friendly wager that I couldn't get a call back. And together, we went to the audition the next morning at the uh, Marriott in Baltimore's Inner Harbor. Walked in a conference room, and a guy rolled a pencil toward me, turned on a camera, and said, when I say action, talk about the pencil. Make me want the pencil. Don't stop talking until I tell you to stop, but make me want the pencil. And unbeknownst to me, that... That was the extent of the audition. If you could talk for eight minutes about a pencil, 
you were given a three-month probationary contract, and they would put you on the air in the middle of the night and bring you items that failed to sell in prime time, items mm -hmm. that looked like they had been purloined from <laughs> some game on the midway of a condemned carnival that the claw would grab, right? I mean, just, just trinkets. Would crap. it be as sudden? When you, when you got the job, would they hand you the product like two seconds before you go on air and talk about this? Or would you have a little prep time and if reading you, to do? If you were the responsible type who <laughs> wanted to keep the job, you would come in early and you would look at all the products that would be brought to you and you would do whatever research you could mm -hmm. to create the illusion of knowledge and interest in, <laughs> in all of them. Um, if you were me, who w was stunned that you were hired, um, you just set your alarm for 2.45 a.m. You went in at five minutes to three. You slathered on some pancake, and you sat down, and you waited until a stagehand brought you the health team infrared pain reliever <laughs> or the Amcor <laughs> negative ion generator or... You know, eel skin wallets for him or plus sized fashions for her. The elegance of 18 karat gold, sterling silver braid. I mean, there was no end to Do it. Do you ever go back and look at footage of this? Um, I do. And the funny thing was, I was just talking about this the other day. It's, there's a, I mean, there, there, there's so many great moments of um, uh, denial and <laughs> cognitive dissonance, <laughs> thanks to the tech we have today. But I was fired three times from QVC over a three-year period. And while it's true that I learned everything I needed to know about this industry in the middle of the night there, I didn't appreciate it at the time, and I didn't talk to anybody about it. It was just a thing I did. And then I went out to start auditioning for work that I really wanted and just kind of forgot about it. Mm -hmm. And then YouTube happened. And then one night, somebody called me and said, hey, are you on YouTube? And I'm like, no, nah, I don't even know what that is. And they said, you should go on YouTube and you should search your name. And so I did. And what I found was somebody had taped uh, my shifts in the old days. Mm -hmm. Because I... This guy's going to be a star. I can see it. No, no. This is even better. They, they taped it. I mean, I, I learned this part of the story years later. But the guy who posted all this old footage of me on YouTube, on QVC, was one of the editors over at The Onion. And at The Onion, they were trying to inspire in their writers a level of irreverence and subversion that he described as uh, such that you would associate with a journalist who was trying to get fired. <laughs> and so he saw in me a a show host who was trying to get fired. And in fact, it was, it was, true. It was true. So yeah, for three years, I basically, uh, Succeeded. Made, well, I made fun of the products that they brought me. Um, and, and, and in some cases, the people who bought them, but mostly I used it as an opportunity to, uh, to, to be honest with the viewer, but at the same time, like you said, figure out like how do you how do you really fill three hours of empty air? Yeah, yeah, right. And this was live, right? This was totally live. live. Yeah. No delay. Mm. I mean, no eight second delay. Nothing. I mean, it's like that's that being a stand up comic. That these are some of the hardest jobs I can imagine. Well, I mean, you you sink or like looking back, that was the genius of the audition. They they learned through bitter experience that hiring accomplished salespeople didn't matter in live television because something different was going to inform your, mm -hmm. your uh, presentation. Likewise, hiring actors uh, didn't mean anything. Like you could be a good actor with a decent presence in front of a camera, but not understand the mechanics of a sale mm -hmm. and vice versa. So they just learned the only way to figure out if these people are gonna explode is to see if they can talk about a pencil for eight minutes. And even then, even then, most people didn't make it through the first three months because it was a crucible, not just of like the learning curve was a right angle, but it's the middle of the night. You're upside down. Your whole circadian rhythm is mm -hmm. a cruel joke. And you're left alone to have a kind of external inner monologue with yourself. Yeah. 
in front of, you know, a million reprobates, lonely hearts, and drunks. I, I want to ask you more about that, like your knack for being able to do that well, because we'll sort of get into your process here in a, in a, in a sort of brief process section that every, everybody loves to hear about how writers and others do it. And there's one main takeaway I've had from doing many, many episodes of the show. And we've had all kinds of writers on here from, from journalists to fiction writers, nonfiction, songwriters, speech mm -hmm. writers. And the one thing that comes across is that's unifying to all those is it's all storytelling. There's an experience to convey through whatever the format is, whether it's a journalist doing an interview or, or getting a, a news story out or a novel, or you know, your many shows, your book, your podcast, they all have an arc. The arc might vary a little bit depending on the format, but you've done it on so many different formats. Like, how do you think about your process with storytelling, whether it's eight minutes on a pencil or your book or, or other things? Well, there's no playbook for me anyway. Eight minutes on a pencil starts with feature benefit. Every feature has a benefit. So if the goal with an eight minute pencil pitch is to fill eight minutes, and it is, you still have to tell a story, but you still have to do it through the lens of what is that feature and what is the benefit. So what I did was say, okay, this is a yellow number two pencil. Why is it yellow? <laughs> because you're a busy person. You have a lot going on. And when you need a pencil, the last thing you need to do is spend precious minutes rooting around for some beige colored implement. What a bunch of bull crap that is. You want a bright canary yellow that'll pop in your cluttered desk drawer. So you grab that bright yellow pencil and then you start to write. And what do you see? Is it that big, fat, disappointing skid mark of a number one or that thin, wispy line of a number three? No, it's a number two. It's exa So, right, every feature. Did you come up with this on the spot in that interview? I did. That's great. I did. But that got me 35 seconds. <laughs> so I got seven and a half minutes, right? And so you go, you, you talk a bit about the eraser and you talk a bit about the silver uh, little mechanism that attaches it to the wood. Uh, you talk about... And I, at this point, I'm just totally freelancing. But that little bit of silver in this case was real silver. That made the cost of the pencil kind of expensive. But we took the profits and we sent it to kids in Madagascar who were starving. Why? Because the lead in the pencil wasn't really lead. It was graphite from Madagascar. So this is a great way to give back to the country. Right. So now, now the whole thing bends into some cause related riff. Was any of that true? You just no. make it up? Yeah. No, I was making up. Um, now you're two minutes in. Mm -hmm. So now the story of the pencil really becomes very personal and you have nothing left to do except think about, well, what do you do with a pencil? You personally, well, you do crosswords. Why do you use a pencil? Well, because like you, I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. And when I make mistakes, I need a mechanism. I need a tool that will allow me to correct them, to erase them and give it another shot. And really, isn't that what life is all about? A mechanism that gives us <laughs> and affords us a measure of grace, all right? I don't have the confidence to use a pen, and I doubt that you do either. So I feel good with a pencil, but that doesn't mean I'm an idiot. I mean, consider Einstein. Some of the greatest theorems ever written down were done in a pencil. Why? Because he needed the same grace. To e equals mc cubed was the original. And then he did the math and he thought, you know something? I think it's squared. So he erased it and put in squared instead. That's not true either, of course, but it <laughs> sounded good. And the guy who was auditioning me is laughing. And then you pivot into your first love letter to Heather Klebe, written in a number two pencil. And you think about Leonardo's first sketches done in pencil. And you think about all the great things. And then before you know it, you're you're just way out there and your imagination has somehow collided with the transactional part of your brain that wants the job because unlike anything you've ever done there's a paycheck attached and then the man who turned on the camera takes the pencil out of your hand and writes you're hired you're hired is that how it ended that's you're how hired. it hired he took the pencil and wrote you're hired and three days later i was wide awake sort of in the middle of the night <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, trying to make sense of the health team. What was Fred the first Hitler. product you, you got handed? It was the first product I got was a, a phone that uh, it, it was the first hands free phone. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was introduced on QVC and it had giant buttons on it. It was, it was a phone for old people with a speaker phone built into it. And you leapt right in just as you did with the pencil. Sure, sure. Awesome.
look, man, you, you, the, the <laughs> stakes are very high. You need to make a quick call. You know, you can't find your glasses. You're at that point in your life where everything's starting to look the same. Do you really need to glance at your phone mm -hmm. and just wrestle with that level of ambiguity? Hell no. You need those numbers <laughs> to <laughs> pop out. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, storytelling, I, I don't, I don't know that you can. How, how many of your shows have been like scripted versus riffing as you did here? Everything I did prior to Dirty Jobs was scripted, at least to the extent that I had a producer or a director or somebody telling me what the goal was. Mm -hmm. um, in those days, it was all about hitting the X, finding your mark, turning to the camera and speaking in a crisp, well-modulated baritone on a mm -hmm. subject you knew nothing about. So. It, Dirty Jobs changed all that. Dirty mm -hmm. Jobs was um, actually, what if you're not really a host, Mike? What if, you're, what if you're really a guest? What if your job is not to create the illusion of uh, knowledge, but to defer to somebody who's with you, who actually knows what they're doing, and maybe you're their apprentice or uh, an avatar for the viewer mm -hmm. or some sort of cipher. And so that was a huge distinction in TV world, it, it did dramatically affect the way I thought about story because now I'm not telling you a story that I, whose ending I know. Now mm -hmm. I'm a more of a fly on the wall and my job becomes to, to bring you there with me mm -hmm. and, and, and all of my uncertainty and, and ignorance, right? Is that how you approach, you know, your podcast now, which is a huge hit podcast, the way I heard it? How do you approach the interviewing there? I mean, obviously, I guess a similar way. You're trying to put someone in the chair and drag it out of them in some way. Or what, do you think of that as having an arc as well? It, you know, to be honest, it, it, it's a little awkward for me because the podcast world is changing so fast and it's filled with so many people who are doing a similar thing. Um, I, I've kind of made a, a living in the last 20 years by not being a host. And you were on my podcast, and I didn't. I didn't want you to look at me as a host. I, I just wanted to talk to just you. Have a conversation. Huh? I just wanted to talk to you, but at the same time, you have to put yourself in in the viewer's place. And I think early on in the podcast world, it was new enough that people were would go along for two dudes talking mm -hmm. about whatever the hell came up. And if those two dudes are really interesting. And there's enough booze, <laughs> then 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 maybe that's yeah. enough, yeah. right? But you know, like the stuff I wanted to talk to you about, it, it it wasn't just your book, but it was hard to do that because I really liked your book. But then I have to say to myself, this guy's been hawking this book now for a while, and having written one, I know how it goes. Mm -hmm. You love it for a while. And then you get excited as you figure it out. And then you write it. And the process of writing, it's great. And then you go into the back and forth with the edit. By the time it finally winds up between two covers, you're mm -hmm. sick of it. Mm -hmm. You're sick of it. And now it's time to go promote it. Yeah. And by week three of the book tour, you sort of got your little spiels oh. down. But then you're like, it's like they pull the string on the doll in the back. And you're like, blah, 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 blah. And you tell the same the thing same story. over. Yeah, right. And they do it the next night at the next bookstore. <laughs> So I think, I think part of what our job is as fake hosts is to at least create the <laughs> illusion. Like, you don't want to ask the question your guest is expecting, but you also don't want to ignore the obvious questions that mm -hmm. you think the listener mm -hmm. wants to hear posed. So in the end, that, that's why liquor is so important, Doug. <laughs> right. It makes everything better. It makes everything. It, especially, it, 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 it lowers expectations yeah. and totally, increases exactly. tolerance. They're like, oh, forgive him. He's drunk. He, he doesn't said, know what he, he's saying. He's three in, for God's sake. <laughs> that's, you know, I had these notes, and normally I don't really want to have notes because I, I really do want it to be a conversation, but there are a couple things I want to get to. And, and doing the video, I don't know what to do with these things. I'm going to try, like, the Letterman, like, that's now. good. Yeah, and that's then we need the glass-breaking sound, and maybe we can layer that in later. <laughs> Um, <laughs> By the way, there are no new ideas. Right, exactly. We're just recycling things. Or you, it's like no someone actually, it's, there's a quote about that. There are no new ideas. It's either you sort of take a big idea and make it small or you reverse it. Or they're like variations on old ideas. But the rarest of all is a new, genuinely new idea. And maybe I, they're none. I've never seen one. <laughs> I, I, I have never, I mean, aside from tech, you know, I've never, like when I, when I, when I think about the styles of writing, like the authors I love, when I think about what feels new, what feels fresh, I can always find somebody else 
who did something really, really similar. It might have been 100 years ago, mm -hmm. but it's all been done. And, you know, the wheel of Fortuna, she, she spins, yeah. you know, and round and round we go, and suddenly everything old is new again. And, yeah. you know, that, and that's okay. You know, it's, it's not bad. It's just that, I don't know, who said, like, there are only six or seven stories. Right, you're all, all variations on, on that. Yeah, there's some... Uh, Just like music. Some famous book about screenwriting or something. It's like every movie yep. fits into one of these seven right. seven things. Well, that was Aristotle. I mean, he was, a, you know, the hero's journey, right? Right, right. So speaking of that, with your book, is there going to be another one? Because, and, and did you outline this one, or how did you select the stories for this one? Because we'll, we'll get into the book uh, next, but it's like there's so many great... Yeah, so thanks. Um all right, I'll, I'll just tell you the truth. Um, I was writing these short uh, stories in the style of Paul Harvey, in which you would learn something you didn't know about somebody you do. Mm -hmm. You might remember the rest of the story. That was Paul Harvey's big thing in the 70s and 80s. And I was always enamored of that. They were, they were mysteries and history smashed together. You wrote a book that did that very thing. You actually turned the diesel story into a kind of whodunit, mm -hmm. which I thought was terribly clever. Harvey did that every week for years. So the way I heard it was my answer to the rest of the story. Mm -hmm. And I got busy writing those. And in the early days, my podcast was specifically geared uh, for the uh, curious mind with a short attention span. Mm -hmm. That's how I marketed it. And nothing was ever longer than 10 minutes. It had a single sponsor. And it was one of these stories. And I wrote them mainly to pass the time while, you know, dirty jobs or whatever we were filming was in production. Uh, uh, planes and trains and greasy spoons. I wrote this book on mm -hmm. the road, mm -hmm. at least the part of it that I call uh, the tile. These, these stories about people I've never met that I always wanted to. Just, just to paint the picture, do you type it in so you like break out a laptop or a pad and paper, coffee, whiskey? Um, how are you, like, if you break it out in a plane, what's, what happens? If I break it out, it, it was, this one was almost always a laptop mm -hmm. because when I'm writing a story, like a short story like this that is rooted in history and facts, Google really is your friend. And mm -hmm. as you write, you can, you can double check yourself, yeah. right? Because I don't intentionally lie in any of these stories, but I'm also not a slave to the truth. That's why the book's called The Way I Heard It. Mm -hmm. That's why the podcast is called The Way I Heard It. I, I, I feel like we're very long in certainty today, and people are super interested in sounding very, very sure of themselves. And I, mm -hmm. I, I wanted a title that at least suggested some, some modesty with regard to the facts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously I wasn't there when Hancock signed the declaration. But cinematically, um, I can imagine what that moment was like. So I take, I take some cinematic liberties in the stories. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wound up with, I don't know, 30 stories or so for the podcast, and the publisher was really pushing hard for a book. And it wasn't this one. They wanted another book, but I was busy with this project because, as you know... Anything that works, including a podcast, turns into a barking dog. And you, you, you toss it scraps, you toss it meat, and it keeps barking, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I've got to write more of these stories for the podcast. The publisher wants something like a memoir. I feel like I haven't done enough to write a memoir, and that just felt too precious, and I didn't want to do that. But we kind of split the baby. And so the book became... 30 some stories about famous people who did something interesting that I always liked that I turned into these short mysteries and then the grout yes appeared between the tile I want yeah I want so I, just to set it up for listeners viewers whatever the the book it does have these incredible historical stories as you say things you didn't know about the people you do and you tie each one into your own personal experiences so it it turns this sort of facts and information into real wisdom and you come away at the end of each one of these things and as you say it becomes a mosaic and in your book you write the grout and the tiles become equally important which i thought was a beautiful way to put it last thing i thought would happen because well when you look at a mosaic you see the tile mm -hmm. you don't see the grout 
And when I started thinking about what the tile would look like without the grout, suddenly it became Dirty Jobs 101. What's the brick wall look like without the grout? Well, it just falls down. It just looks like a pile of bricks. The grout's the thing that holds all of it together mm-hmm. in all things, whether you're a mason or a writer. And so I was able to <laughs> persuade the publisher to publish this book because I said, look, it is a memoir. It's just told from the inside out. And it is a history book for the curious mind with a short attention span. And if I land the plane right, when you get to the end, all of the preceding ruminations should rhyme in a way that, while not necessarily profound, it at least starts to feel a little more deliberate Mm -hmm. than the Forrest Gumpian approach that you know, it feels like as you as you go through it. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I hope it doesn't sound precious. I'm not a writer by trade, but I love story. And I love storytelling. And the reason I haven't written more on purpose over the years is because I'm 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 scared to bitch up my hobby. I, I write I write, Doug, because it compresses time. And when I'm really into it and you tell me if this has happened for you. You sit down, maybe it's coffee, maybe it's a Manhattan, and you've got an idea, and it's like a splinter in your mind, mm-hmm. and you're going to get it down, and you do. But when you look up... It's dark. Like six hours have gone by. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I say it in the foreword, and, I, and it's the truth. I can't tell you how many times on the tarmac of SFO, I opened up the laptop which, by the way, I had to kind of hide because you're not allowed to do it during takeoff, which is bull crap. <laughs> it's just absolute nonsense. Right. Um, I love that. If your seat's this way or this way, you know, everyone dies on the plane. Every everyone seat backs need to be up. Oh, for God's sakes. <laughs> Turn that phone off. Anyway, yeah. I, uh, I looked up, and there I was on the tarmac at JFK mm-hmm. over and over again. So writing is just great fun because as Stephen King said in a terrific book called on writing. Yeah. It, it's a time machine, mm-hmm. you know, and if you do it right, you can, you can warp time, not just for the reader, but for yourself. Mm-hmm. And, and I didn't want to wreck that with a bunch of deadlines and a bunch of stuff. I'm up to my neck in stuff in TV and in podcast landia and all the other media. I didn't, I didn't want to jump into the machine yeah, of publishing, even though I, well, I, I hope do you love. get excited about enough about doing another one of these that it won't feel like jumping into the machine and it'll feel like warping time again. Because this was so fun, I would love to read ten more. Look, and I, like I read it, I love to read when I have two three hours blocked out and I can dedicate that much time to the reading, which I started with this, and then I had a little bit to go and I was traveling, so I caught the, the rest of it in these ten minute increments, which also worked because it's designed that way. Yeah. You can read it for ten minutes or three hours. It's look it's so if you, fun. I mean, uh, honestly, if you really, because I, I admire you as a writer, and people have said nice things about the book, and it it did well, but the conversation is still ongoing. What I'm supposed to be doing right now in publishing land is sitting down and writing like the the big thing, and mm-hmm. I, I just don't, I just don't know if anybody gives a damn, you know. But I do think people live their lives today in fits and starts and whether it's TikTok or reels or you know whatever your vice of choice is it is short attention span theater Mm -hmm. and look i know people love to dig in i i I know that's still out there but i i liked the autobiography biography back and forth i Mm -hmm. i thought it i mean it was fun to write and i've got Hundreds of more stories. I could do it again. If you want, I'll, I'll dedicate it to you. The epigram will be for you. Oh, hey, I'll take it. Uh, you, you get another Manhattan if you do that. Um, Done. Would you, uh, Done. by the way, Mary, there is some over here. It might be getting slightly water, but if you'd like to fill that glass, we've got some. Well, well I hope you do it because I think, you know, one of the reasons why certain people are succeeding online right now is people want to hear their perspective. We were just talking about this before we started the show, that people with a point of view. And so when you take some history and then also share your point of view on it, that's meaningful to people who care what you think. And I think that helps you connect with people, and the well, book works that way. Thank you. But I do think the permission it is, is still limited. 
like what it, what it, what I tried to do was say like there's a chapter in the book that spoiler alert but it talks about the sinking of the Titanic mm -hmm. and it uh, it's from the point of view of the cook who famously was the last one in the water Charles Joffin was his name and he went in fairly drunk um, he helped people into the lifeboats he in fact if you saw the movie he's in it he's mm -hmm. right up there with Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet he's the cook on the stern as the whole boat goes in he's mm -hmm. the last one in and he's the only one who survived who was plucked out of the water three hours later and so this is a story that was on the podcast that I really liked writing. And after it, the question is, what do you have to say about that? You know, and, and I thought, well, you know, I remembered the first time I was in Dutch Harbor back before Deadliest Catch was a show that's now been on the air 20 years. The network sent me up there to figure out what that show was. And I didn't know if I was going to be a host. I didn't know if I was going to be a greenhorn. At that point, I was both, and we were just trying to figure out what, how do we tell the story of crab fishermen in the Bering Sea in January? And then a boat sank, like right in front of me, for real. Mm -hmm. Six men died. And that's what I meant by, like, rhyming. If you can find a moment in your life that rhymes with fill in the blank, the Titanic, the Gutenberg Press, mm -hmm. whatever it is, mm -hmm. Well, at least it's at least it's personal. I, yeah. I'll leave it to the reader to decide if it's interesting. But it was interesting to me. Yeah. And so to find those connections and to find those parallels, both in history and in your own personal curriculum, uh, it was Tech. very clever the way you tied each one of those into your own experience in some way, like how that piece of history meant something personal to you. I, I really it's gratifying to hear because yeah. I couldn't tell if it was clever or just self indulgent. No, what, 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 you're what, like what, the least pretentious, self indulgent person I think I've met. Oh, um, there, there, are a couple, there are a couple that I wanted to pull out. From, and again, we'll try not to spoil these, but there was one. And just this one gets to sort of the heart of how you do a twist to each one, because I'm reading this one where I'm like, oh, this is Trump, 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 Trump. And then in the end, it wasn't Trump. No. And it kind of speaks to the and again, we won't spoil it, but it speaks to the importance of studying history, because we all think we're living in the most hysterical of times. And if you study history, it's like, no, it's, no, you know, it's been, not. it's been equally or more hysterical in the past. I remember reading this biography by Meacham of Andrew Jackson. Oh, and my God, it was like, do we, I mean, we want to talk this, about this even when I was on your show. I, so I was talking about this recently, but it was so toxic then. I mean, the partisanship was. They were fighting there, there duels. Like bloodlust. Yes. They duels. were fighting duels. There were yeah. fights in Congress. Yeah. Like fist fights. Yeah. Canings. So every time I hear someone say, like, it's never been more fill in the blank, oh, like, please. it probably has been more at some point in history. It's kind of what I meant to say 10 minutes ago when I said there are no new ideas. Mm. The Wheel of Fortuna spins, and everything old is new again. And it doesn't matter if it's a song or a book or a movie or history. We've been here. We've done that. Mm -hmm. We fought a war, you know. Um, and look, personally, I think Reagan was right when he talked about uh, freedom being a generation away. But I think he, it was brought. I think everything's a generation away. Everything. Mm -hmm. There's there's no such thing as a new joke if you haven't heard it before. There's a funny line. Eugene O'Neill is that playwright, and uh, he has a funny line. There's there is no present or future. There's only the past repeating itself again and again and again and again. Yeah, and Joseph Ellis said, um, history is, uh, is not the past. It's the past we choose to remember. So we get to mm -hmm. choose. And then we get yeah. to choose the way we remember it, which, modesty aside, is adjacent to the way I heard it. But that's what everybody's doing. I think mm -hmm. in some way, shape, or form, everybody is trying to take what they think they know and how they understand a thing they believe happened and, and shape it and mm -hmm. think about it in a way that's relevant. That, that actually gets me to my next one that I want to talk about, you know, in terms of the news and how we interpret the present, what we choose to remember about the past. You talk about John Stewart in one, and he was at the early, uh, so he was a comedian on the, uh, the Daily Show. But he started doing sort of like a fake news show. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, 
it, it's the original fake news, really. And I think he was, almost, I guess it was Colbert who was impersonating Bill O'Reilly. But John Stewart was doing that before Colbert was doing it on the, the his, you know, his show, The Daily Show. But the strangest thing happened after a time is that his audience began to interpret him almost as real news or his opinion on thing was like taken as almost fact. So he would do these things. And I'm dying to get your thoughts on it because I know he's a friend of yours, but um, I have I have real mixed feelings about it because I think he was very aware of how seriously and sometimes literally he was taken mm, and he as was a newsman. And he, he was uncomfortable, but he also seemed to exploit it in some ways. He like did. he definitely has a point of view and a... <laughs> A, 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 an ideology, and yeah. I think he could get people riled up, and he knew he was riling them up, and he knew he wasn't saying. And then, and then you'd go to him and say, "Well, you're doing this." He's like, "Well, I'm a comedian. If it's, it's not my fault they're taking me seriously." I just felt, I felt that was a phony defense. Well, it was phony, but it was also true. You know, you, you, <clears throat> all of, like you can get away with a certain amount of stuff if ten thousand people are listening to you. You can get away with less stuff if a hundred thousand mm-hmm. people. And even less if 10 million people. So what happened to John was the show blew up. And the fact that he was making fun of all the traditional constructs in news, from the existence of the prompter to all of the tropes and bromides and platitudes and all of the stuff that contributes to the overarching feeling that leads a lot of reasonable people to conclude the whole thing is just bullcrap and all performance, right? He took all the air out of that tire. Mm -hmm. And as a result, people really started to listen, like seriously listen to what he had to say. Um, It came to a head in a a survey, uh, I want to say it was 2008, where he was voted the most trusted source of news in the country <laughs> more than more than call more than jennings more than anyone he was the most trusted source of news and that's when people started to criticize him when his slip showed and that's when he said hey whoa i'm just a comedian yeah and so the all shucks thing might work with ten thousand viewers but it doesn't work with 10 million mm-hmm. and so people started to go well wait no, what have we done here? And so what's interesting is the, is the weird nexus of, of trust, entertainment, um, parody, and satire. And it's, it's what's so missing today. It's what, it's what cancel culture has most suppressed, the comics voice. Mm-hmm. The satire. It, it's why the B is so brilliant. Unfortunately, it's why... The Babylon B is, is the best. And there was a time when The Onion held that position. Yeah. No more. But then they went kind of wokey. Yep. And, uh, yeah. Yep. You can see their slip. You can yeah. see it showing. The B and Seth have been super, it, super, the super The real comedians, consistent. like Dave Chappelle, they're the last bastion of free speech in a way. I mean, it's like... Truth to yeah, power. Yeah. Truth yeah. to power. So... Yeah, John, I thought, got, got caught up in the whole medianess of it. But look, he's still like, he's back. He's coming back to do that show. Is he, what is he doing now? He, he's going to do The Daily Show once a week. Oh, I, th- I didn't know that. Yep, they just announced it. But you could see it coming two years ago. I don't even know if it was two years ago. But remember when he went on to Colbert's show? And started talking about the Hershey thing with the uh, was yeah. that the one? Yeah, yeah chocolatey goodness <laughs> broke out in Hershey, Pennsylvania, and experts think it might have something to do, right? And so it's the same thing. That was thing. well done. It's, it yeah. was, but that's exactly that was funny mm-hmm. and painful and awkward and inconvenient all at the same time. Mm-hmm. And when a comic can do that, or really anyone, I mean, it's not purely the you know, the real estate of the comic. Well, but I don't know anybody you know, can do it. Maybe it's not going to work as well on daily, uh, the Daily Show anymore because everyone's become fake news. Like, it, it was one thing for him to do it when it was sort of unique, you know, 20 years ago or whatever it was. But now it's, it's like tough. everyone is has the same adherence to fact that he had at that time. Sidebar. Full disclosure. I was hired to host The Daily Show twice. When? First time was before it went on the air. Giant national search came down to two guys, Craig Kilborn and me. The network wanted Craig, but Craig was tied up with ESPN 
Mm -hmm. and they weren't going to let him out of his deal. So they offered me the job on a Friday, invited me to come in on a Monday to meet the writers. Over the weekend, they let him out of his contract, and Doug Herzog hired Craig, and Craig got the show. I went on to do a game show that nobody watched called No Relation. <laughs> a year later, Craig... Was that when you met Dick Clark, or that was... Yeah, yeah that was okay. Dick Clark. Yeah. yeah, he's in the book. God, that guy changed my life, Legend. Too. That guy's yep. awesome. Absolute legend. Anyway, uh, Craig gets a better offer, goes to CBS, I guess, and they call me back. Madeline Smithberg over at Comedy Central calls and says, Mike, uh, we still love you. And as you may have read, we have an opening. And you, my friend, are a slam dunk. We really, really want you back. And honestly, the only way that this isn't going to fall in your direction is if this cheap-ass network <laughs> comes up with a giant pile of money for Norm MacDonald or Dennis Miller or somebody. But that's never going to happen. And uh, a week later, it was $4 million bucks for Jon Stewart, and mm. off we go. And I went off to do Dirty Jobs. So no regrets. I, it, 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 you it are all still a great. slam dunk for that job. Here, they should do John Stewart for two nights, and then you for two <laughs> nights. I would watch that, but I'll do the fifth night. Do you guys, but that would be great. I think that'd be a great way to shape up the week over there. Well, it would have been a different show, you know, um, for sure. Why is he only doing what? What are they doing the other four nights? I don't know. I don't know what they're up to, but I do. I do worry for the same reason you just said. I don't. I don't know that you can put the the poop back in the goose. You know, like I really worry. I like toothpaste in the tube better than the poop oh, and the look, goose. Man, I'm the dirty jobs guy, and <laughs> I'm the guest. I'm always right. Uh, no, it, it, it's. Um, I thought a lot about it during lockdowns when it was obvious that dirty jobs should go back on the air. We went out of production in um, 2012, and we had done 300. No regrets. I was done. I was on to other stuff, but all of a sudden, essential work, headline news and so forth, and I thought it would be good, and the network agreed, but I was really worried that, like, I'm older than I've ever been, and does anybody want to see a 59, 60-year-old dude crawling through the sewers again, channeling his inner eight-year-old <laughs> while we celebrate the changing face <laughs> of the modern-day proletariat? I didn't know. I just, mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't know if I had permission to do it. Turns out I did, but I, but I didn't know until I, until I put it out there. So I don't know what'll happen to John. We'll see. Yeah. You know, he's older than he's ever been. He's got it. He's got the gray beard going. He's still cranky. He's still funny. I think he'll be fine. I think the age thing doesn't even matter. I'm just. I look at the bench of young talent coming up, and it's like there's nobody. Like who's at Fox News? And I don't even know who these people are. Then Fox or CNN. It's like all the great talent has left the cable news environment. And they're off doing their own thing. They're off in new media where you are. Well, you live with one, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's the irony of that business. What they need are Bill O'Reilly and Glenn Beck and Megyn Kelly and personalities who own their point of view, who aren't afraid to share it. Once they get it... Who also are, are fact-based. So you know, you can trust what's happening. You know? but, yeah. but are not afraid to, you know, like mm -hmm. to synthesize all of that into something mm -hmm. that feels like a point of view. But the minute you get that, if you're an executive, well, that's, that's a problem. That's a panic. Because now you've got an audience who's relating more to the person than the platform. That's right. Yeah. And like, when's the last time we saw that? That's, I mean, think of 2016. Think of those 17 candidates on stage for the GOP. Think of Reince Priebus or whoever it was saying, oh, mm -hmm. there's, like, we got women and we got people of color and we've got so much, to, so many to choose from. Anybody but that guy in the middle, mm -hmm. right? Anybody but him. And mm -hmm. what did the Republican Party want? They wanted the guy in the middle. And so what do you do if you're a brand who suddenly realizes your customers want something you don't want them to have? That's also what happened to Dirty Jobs. Dirty Jobs snuck onto the air out of nowhere. It was a smart aleck crawling through a sewer, making all kinds of puerile jokes while he was celebrating the nature of work. That's not David Attenborough or Jacques Cousteau or Jane Goodall. That's not any of the big discovery shows. But what happened? The people watched. And now we got a chance to see what do you do if you're an executive who has a hit that you don't want to be a hit? 
What do you mm-hmm. do if you're an operative who has a candidate who you don't want to be mm-hmm. popular? What do you mm-hmm. do if you're a publisher? Here you go. Let's way to bring it back to to all this. What do you do if you're a publisher who has a best selling book that you hate? You hate the fact that you've published this book. You hate the fact that people love this book. Mm-hmm. You're getting all kinds of grief at your cocktail parties. All your friends are looking at you funny. How could you put that book out there? Mm-hmm. Right. So I think there's I think there's a lot of that going on at networks and publishing houses and everywhere. It's going on at Bud Light. It's going mm-hmm. on at Target. Mm-hmm. Everywhere people are trying to figure out how not to blow themselves up, yeah. even as they tell the truth. Yeah, yeah. Well, w- with regard to talent at the cable primetime shows and the networks, I feel like any talent there who has enough of an independent, uh, is enough of an independent force, independent talent, to make the leap to do it independently, to work for themselves, they've already done it. There's nobody left there who can, who can do it anymore. Hmm. Maybe, maybe a couple. There might be a couple over at Fox that I can think of. Um, but you know maybe a couple on the network you know but it's just like most people have done it and i think the people who are left are looking like oh i want to do what they're doing over there i want to do what mike rose's doing i want to do what megan kelly's doing greener grass though doug right you got to be careful right everybody's different everything like i was just having a conversation about the difference between trying to build a platform with subscribers versus really embracing the advertising model and I don't think... Well, do you, you do both? I don't. Your subs only? I, I'm... Or are you advertising? Uh, all advertising. All ads, yeah. And I, I, and I haven't talked to, to Megan about this, but I suspect we're singing out of the same hymn book in the sense that in the end, you have to ask somebody for money if you're trying to build a business. Mm-hmm. So do you ask your, your fans and your customers or do you ask the advertisers? Mm-hmm. Again, no wrong answer, but it's really interesting to see. Well, I think someone like Daily Wire does a bit of both. They, that's they have right. an ad model, and then they have a premium subscription content piece too. That you can, which is yeah. a good hedge for them if they have a trouble, if they run into some sort of advertiser ban or something. But, but imagine if it happened in publishing, right? Imagine if you read The Great Gatsby. And I find this is good. This is really terrific. And then on the last page, they're like. To enjoy chapters next, next, and You're next, right? Yeah. right? <laughs> like, well, wait, well, no, no, no. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I bought, I bought my ticket. I, I, I want to get to the end of the ride. Mm-hmm. So, look, I, I worry that. Well, it could be like see Mike Rowe, you know, sing in the shower. That could be some special <laughs> personal content, you know, that's not connected to the next chapter. It's just you know oh, something right. a little behind well, the scenes, or maybe you pay not to see it. But, <laughs> but whatever the case, we have. I, I keep coming back to permission. Because I know how much I used to have, right? But I know it's it's fungible. I mm-hmm. had a certain amount of permission in the opera, on QVC, on a hundred other shows before Dirty Jobs. I had a lot of permission on Dirty Jobs to see where the, you know, here be dragons part of the map is. Uh, it's always uh, a struggle or a risk to to figure out where that line is with your listeners and mm-hmm. and and with your viewers. And I'm very lucky. I've got, I've got a fairly loyal fan base, but I don't know that I want to find out how loyal. By the way, very loyal. Just so listeners and viewers know, we're sitting in the studio and people are walking by. We're in this sort of glass room here. People can walk by and see us. People are coming by here like I, I, that one conversation. The one guy came in and was like, "You're my Dianetics. You know, you're. My, I'm, my, I'm raising my kids based on listening to you. This is how the world should be. And it's thank you for all you do. And so you, you've got a lot of devoted fans out there." Look, man, I, it's very flattering, and I, uh, I'll take some measure of credit, I guess maybe some, but honestly, that same year that Jon Stewart was at the top of that list, I was on it too. Mm-hmm. I wasn't that high, but when it came to trust, I kept popping up like on the Forbes list. And yours list. was not ironic. Well, <laughs> Yours was actually real. I wasn't trying to be <laughs> ironic. But but again, it's the company you keep. That same year, Discovery was rated, and nobody disagreed, as the most trusted brand in media mm. around the world. People loved and trusted Discovery. Ford what was flying high with more goodwill, I think, than I'd ever seen assigned to any giant company because Alan Mulally 
sat there in Congress and after GM and all the others said, okay, we'll take the money in exchange for taking no salary, Alan said, you know something, I think I'm going to, uh, I think I'm going to keep my salary and I think the taxpayers should keep their money. And if this company can't survive based on our ability to pivot and compete in this market, we deserve to be out of business. Crap, man. I fell in love with that guy yeah. right then. And I worked for him for years. And so when I was, when I got the best cards I ever got, it was when I was out there working for two incredibly trusted brands. And that gave me permission to do what I wanted to do, which weirdly was to crawl through a sewer. And when you're covered with other people's crap and looking <laughs> into the lens and saying things, uh, think of... Think of it however you want. That guy's probably not trying to sell you something. He's probably not going to ask you to do anything, you know, that he wouldn't do. Mm -hmm. And so the guy who came in here earlier and said all those nice things, he, he saw that, mm -hmm. you know. And back to the permission thing, that's why we have a foundation today. I still do. I'll, you know, from time to time, I'll do deals for money. I'll, I'll do all sorts of things if it makes sense. And it's congruent with what I think my brand is. But, but mostly today, if, if it makes sense for the foundation, I'll say it, I'll sing it, I'll write it, I'll, I'll do an interpretive dance for you as you make me another Manhattan. <laughs> I don't, I don't, <laughs> it's, it's, it's all for sale, like all a pencil. Well, that, that's my cue. By the way, I could go on about this book all day long. I had a number of chapters picked out to hit, but I, I don't want to spoil them. And, I, and people should just read the book because it's such a fun and... Really provocative, thought thought provoking uh, read. Thanks. But before we get into the lightning round to to close the show, I am going to put a little more bourbon in my glass. I don't know how you're doing over there. Well, well I'm I'm, I'm uh, conspicuously void of the aforementioned amber liquid. Now this might be a little watered down. I might just go. Isn't like, everything these days really need on top of that? Is need that on right? That's fine. All right. Thank you. So fortify us for the the final. Well, it's electrolytes, final, Doug. Final. It's, it's critical. <laughs> it's like Gatorade, basically. The last thing we want to do is get all, you know, dehydrated during the lightning round. <laughs> all right. So on that note, then, cheers yeah. again. Cheers. This has been a lot of fun. Terrific. Okay. First question for Mike Rowe. God, this is self-serving, but that's good. I'm just saying... Technically, it's not bourbon because it's from Tennessee. It's as good as the first sip, really. That might be my the numbness, but it's <laughs> like it's a little warm, but it's still delicious. It's going, it's good and neat. Uh, favorite book as a kid? Ooh. Uh, Curious George had an impact on me. You know, the man in the yellow hat. Yeah. I just, I mean, when I think back about curiosity and the role it played through Discovery and a lot of other shows. I, th I think the first time it really sparked was with that. Treasure Island was big. Yeah. And then weirdly, I don't know if this happened to you, but as a kid on the reading list in, in the eighth grade, we had to read Lord of the Flies. Yeah, it seems early for that, right? It's scary. What the hell? I think our son read it, and he was pretty disturbed by it. He's in eighth grade. He just read it, and it was like, this is like kind of gnarly. I, I don't. I still don't get it. <laughs> all, all the talk about, oh, that, that book's inappropriate for this, that, or that. I'm like... The kids Poor are left Piggy. alone. Yeah, Piggy, his, his, his glasses. Little glasses, right? <laughs> it's it's the. <laughs> I mean, it's a chilling book, and yeah. I I probably shouldn't have read it when when I was thirteen, but I did. Yeah, and it still informs. Uh, actually, I I don't know what it informs, but here I am talking about it. Yeah, it's all these years later. Saying. Well, and Curious George, that's, you're the first person to mention Curious George, which I love. We I remember reading that to our kids and. I don't know, there's a, there was a pretty good show around that that we'd watch too, but it's good good messaging on Curious George. Sure. Book or books you're reading now? So I don't know if this has happened to you, but I mean, I'm reading a lot of books based on the people I'm talking to on my podcast mm -hmm. because I think it's polite and, and I'm, I'm curious. Sometimes I'll read a book and I'll be like, let's, let's get that person. I, I want to talk to that person. But other times, right, the tail wags the dog. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, having said that, at the moment, I'm reading a book called American Flannel that talks about the business of um, uh, manufacturing in this country. You know, 70% uh, of everything we wore in 1980 was made in the USA. Mm -hmm. Today it's like 4%. And so mm -hmm. I'm really fascinated about what, 
what it might take to get textile manufacturing back, yeah. back in this yeah. country. I'm also reading uh, The Canceling of the American Mind by Greg Lukianoff and Ricky Schlott. That is the um, sequel to The Coddling of the American Coddling Mind. Coddling of the American Mind, yeah. Ricky Both Schlott, I follow her terrific. on Instagram or Twitter or something like that. She's, she's amazing. She's good. Yeah. 23 years old. Yeah. I think she used to work for Megan, maybe. I'm not sure. Good. She should hire her but back. Speaking of... Uh, the show and reading for the show. I was just in Barnes and Noble. I came across this book called The World by Richard Haas, who's mm. the foreign yeah. policy guy. And uh, I picked him up. Well, this sounds interesting. The World. What a, what a big title. And then I go in there and he covers from the Thirty Years' War, ending in like 1630 or something, to 1914 in nine pages, like the history of the world. And that, I'm like, my God, that's ambitious. I got to see how the hell this guy does that. Yeah. So I read it. It's a terrific book. I mean, it's meant to be a primer just to get people to take on a little bit more history i'm like well i i want to have this i want to have him on the show because it's, it's a great book i love and it's it. an important book for people and uh anyway so he's coming on soon and but it's it's one of the joys of this show of i'll be like yours you'll be able to do those kind of things well have you read uh the body no bill, bill bryson i'll get that Is oh good? my god the sunburn land lost continent he he's such a terrific writer he wrote a book also called at home mm -hmm. where he was so lazy, his publisher wanted him to go out all around the world and write, like, just the history of the world, essentially. Mm -hmm. And he was tired, so he stayed home, and he wrote about, really, the history of the world from the perspective of his vestibule, his bathroom, his bedroom. Like, he, he uses the home mm -hmm. as the center or the launching point. It's, it's terrific. Did you have him on? I haven't talked to Bill. I'm a little intimidated by him. I'd, <laughs> I'd like to meet him. But in the foreword, he wanders up into his attic, and he's in, like, some giant house next to an old graveyard and an old church on the western part of England. And he's in an attic that runs the whole length of the house. And he's up just uh, rummaging around, and he, and, he, and he walks down sort of like a hallway made of... Uh, the various boxes that he has up there. And somehow he finds a door that he didn't know he had in his house. There's a little door and he opens it and he walks out. It's like Narnia. It, it's just <laughs> like C.S. Lewis, right? He gets out and, he, and this passageway leads between two dormers and suddenly he's standing out on his roof looking out on the town from a perspective he didn't even know he had. Mm -hmm. And what he sees is the local church that appears to be sinking into the land. And it, he knows it's an optical illusion, but he doesn't know what's calling it, causing it. So he invites a guy over, a local historian, who basically tell he asks the question, how many people do you think are buried in that graveyard? And Bill says, I don't know, 500, 1,000? He said, try 600,000. And he basically explains that in this part of England, people have been living pre-Roman times, mm. this church itself is hundreds of years old. And he said, the amount of people who have lived and died in this little tiny place on this little island of ours is so overlooked and so forgotten, in much the same way you overlooked and forgot about the door you had up there in the attic, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's when he was like, I'm going to write a story about history from the perspective of the people in that graveyard who nobody remembers at all and how they lived. That's right? great. It's, it's a terrific read, and mm -hmm. somebody, somebody, Mary, ought to turn it into some sort of documentary of some kind <laughs> for that's some that, sort of network. That's a gifted mind for storytelling. I, uh, I think of you as America's storyteller, like the way you tell yeah. stories that, you know, across your, your different shows and venues. Like when I think of you, that's how I think of you as America's storyteller. Well, I know it's the lightning round, forgive me, but my mother is now officially America's grandmother. She's working on her fourth book. Her first was a bestseller. She was 80. That's amazing. She's eight. She wrote every day for that, 60 years. That's probably years. the Guinness Book of World Records, like oldest debut. It should be. Bestseller. It, it's not, as far as I know at the moment, but no one's done what Peggy Rowe has done. By the way, speaking of Guinness Book of World Records, I remember years ago seeing Regis Philbin come in as like the most broadcast hours of television you know mm. for as many you can't be far behind that but all your years I, on qvc it's like how many hours did you log there i did uh five times three 15 hours a week for three years okay. i mean look regis was very very old 
And, uh, <laughs> and he's been doing it for I a very long more. I time. I thought you were doing like five hour blocks at QVC for, you know, many years. I actually did uh, 28 hours once as a result of straight a, through. Yeah. There was a wow. snowstorm. Nobody could get in. Nobody. Could... <laughs> so you were like locked. They wouldn't let you leave the studio. <laughs> if you're listening but not watching, for the record, Doug Brunt just spit Noble Tennessee whiskey <laughs> right out of his mouth, straight down his chin, and yep, onto his all notes. Of his yep. <laughs> Yeah, man, when you've been on the air 28 hours, that's like, that's telethon stuff. Yeah, my God. You start Did saying. they bring food to you and oh, yeah. drink? And they, they brought everything. <laughs> Com- no, are there commercials? It is a commercial. It is a commercial. Yeah, so bathroom breaks, how'd you do that? I had a stadium pal. <laughs> what is that? Oh, a stadium pal is terrific. Um, it's, a, it's a small repository. Think like a no, small. No, no. They brought uh, it out to you on set? One. No, I always wear them. I got one right now. I've used it twice. <laughs> it's tucked into my sock, and I wear a condom with a tube that feeds directly. So I can sit here and drink my whiskey and talk hey, to you for you hours. You can outlast me. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> That's a full disclosure. That's a David Sedaris story called Stadium Pal. And it is, well, dare I say, Peter Pan's funny. Oh, man. All right, back to the lightning round. Yeah. So speaking of America's storyteller, most daunting issue facing America today. I read an article last week in the journal that said uh, 37% of Americans still believe the American dream is real, which would mean 67% don't. So two-thirds of the country has uh, given up on the idea of the American dream, whatever that means to you. And I was at this uh, conference last week that literally was devoted to redefining the American dream and and trying to put some sides on it. My foundation does a lot of work with uh, skilled trades, right? We offer these work ethic scholarships. And so I'm, I'm currently just baffled by that. I'm, I'm, that's the thing that worries me most. If, 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 if we have like the fat part of the bat convinced that, the system's rigged or the thumb is on the scale Mm -hmm. or that there's no hope, you know, that's, that's really bad for this generation. So one of the things I'm doing now with MicroWorks is working with CEOs of companies who in many cases have eliminated the need for a four year degree in their hiring process Mm -hmm. and other companies that really just hire workers, but have a 14 to 18 month, path to a guaranteed six-figure salary and so i i think it's going to be really important in the coming months and years to make a persuasive case for opportunity because i'm afraid a lot of people just don't think it's there anymore and that's that's a tragedy that's also dirty jobs 101 by the way look that was always a show first and foremost you know, exploding toilets, misadventures, and animal husbandry and whatnot. But under it were some pretty big themes. And mm-hmm. one of them was there's a lot of Celebrating the, yeah, yeah. Celebrate it. Acknowledge it. There are a lot of ways to go. It's not, you know, this yeah. whole broad brush, best path for the most people. But that's so platitudinous and, and dangerous, I'm afraid. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I, if I worry about stuff, that's... That's an alarming that's stat. Where did you get that stat? Wall Street Journal. I was in journal. My God. Yeah. All right. Well, flipping that around, key ingredients to a good life. Um. Well, the smart Alec in me says, um, you know, I mean, a sense of humor, a sense of irony, you know, affordable whiskey, and a <laughs> like a firm mattress, I guess. Uh, but at this same conference I just mentioned, you know, I was, I was, I was invited to like answer a version of that question. It was like, what, what's the um, what is the American dream, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and, and for me, it, it's been the ability to do something that needs to be done that I, that I also happen to love. Robert Frost says it great in a poem called um, Two Tramps in Mud Time. He's out in his backyard chopping wood, which he loves to do. I mean, he just writes stands after stands about how much he loves it. And these two lumberjacks, these tramps who've been sleeping in the lumber camps, they come out of the woods and they're hungry. And they want to chop the wood for him, right? Mm -hmm. The first stanza goes, uh, out of the mud, 
two strangers came and caught me splitting wood in the yard. One of them put me off my aim by hailing heartily. Hit him hard. I knew pretty well why he stayed behind and let the other go on away. I knew pretty well what he had in mind. He wanted to take my job for pay. And so the, the poem is this moral dilemma about what do you do when your, when your hobby collides with somebody else's job, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he writes, you know, a lot about how much he loves cutting wood and so forth. But in the end, there's this confrontation of sorts. These guys are standing there waiting for the chance to earn a living doing this thing he does for fun. And he says, um, nothing on either side was said. They knew they had but to stay their stay, and all their logic would fill my head because I had no right to play at what was another man's work for gain. My right might be love, but theirs was need, and where the two exist in twain, theirs was the greater right agreed. But my object in living is to unite my avocation with my vocation, as my mm -hmm. two eyes make one in sight. For only where love and need are one, and the work is play for mortal stakes, can the deed be truly done for heaven and for future sakes. So for me, I mean, that's Frost. He's the greatest mm -hmm. American poet of all time. And he's saying, I think pretty tidily, that if you can figure out a way to do something that needs to be done, that you also happen to love, you win. Mm -hmm. In other words, write a great book. Right. <laughs> By the way, your ability to recite prose and songs is unbelievable. If somebody texts me a phone number and then I have to flip to like dial it, yeah. I have to go back to the text like two or three times to make sure just to get seven numbers. I, I, you're like reciting line after line after line. That's amazing. My mind cannot do that. Can I give you a hint? Is there a way to do it? Do you have a trick? Yeah. I would love that. It's music. You, you remember it's music. Uh, a phone number? Uh, <clears throat> eight, eight, six, seven. Eight, six, three, seven, oh, nine. Five, three, oh, nine. <laughs> you can put anything. Tommy Two Tone. Tommy Two Tone. All right. Yeah. So you remember that? Yeah. Interesting. So yeah, there's there's music and everything, and there's poetry and everything, and there's prose and everything, uh, even in a sewer. Mm -hmm. And if you can find a way to like make it rhyme in your mind and and put a little melody to it, it'll, all right, it'll stick. I'm gonna try that. I don't think that's gonna get me to a long Robert Frost poem, but. Yeah. All right, next, let's see. Best way to stay informed as a citizen. This is, you know, coming off our John Stewart and your new gig on The Daily Show as well for two nights a week. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow, I mean, I'll, that's, that's such a great question. And I, I, think, I think maybe it's, it's like more of a shotgun than a rifle. You yeah. know, I think you have to hit everything. That's I a think, great way to put it. I, I think you have to I think you have to listen to people you don't like and go to sites you don't admire. Not I just think to be aware, like National Review and Huffington Post. Mm -hmm. I, I think you need to read them both. If if mm -hmm. you really want to be informed. But I'm not even sure it, it No, no, it's more like going to church now. You just want to hear the thing. You want to yeah. If you want to get preached, if you want to preach to the choir, obviously. You know, but it, it, like your question presupposes that anybody really wants to be informed. <laughs> That's true. Right. And, yeah. and if you really and truly want to be informed, then, you know, I think you're entering a kind of meat grinder because. Not well, let's say, let me flip the question a little bit. Like where, how do you stay informed? Where are you, what are your like top five, 10 places you go? You know, I, I actually go to the national review mm -hmm. and it's not because I agree with them all the time. I just think it, there's some really great writers there. It feels like there's a steady hand there. They're yep. smart. And um, I like and, Andy. and you know that they're center right, you know, so you kind of know do. their perspective on it, and you can balance that out for yourself. I absolutely do. I, I think Andy McCarthy is super smart, like never super wrong. smart legal mind. Yeah. He, yep, I, I admire that a lot. Um, and 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 two, you know, it's such a tricky question, man, because it, like being informed is it different than being aware? Because to be aware, you you can just flick around. And you can see kind of what's going on, and you can hear whatever perspective is is coming at you. But I don't know if that informs you really. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm I'm more interested in, in in trying to figure out what's the upside of knowing a thing. What am I going to do with this information? 
Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm very curious, like 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 the monkey. You know, I'm curious, George. So I'm when it comes to the Middle East, when it comes to the Ukraine, I I want to know. You know, I I want to be responsible. I think it's part of being a citizen. I just don't. I just don't know what to do with the information once I have it, given how fast things change and knowing mm-hmm. that the next day is going to be just another hot mess, <laughs> just another bullion base of stuff. <laughs> what am I going to do with it? I mean, I, I just don't know what to do. It's like, great, I'm informed. Now mm-hmm. what? Yeah. Have another Manhattan. Right. Exactly. I mean, really, that's the answer to so many things. Okay. Dirtiest job other than Oscars. Oh, you mean Oscar the Grouch? Yeah. Going back Because to... you, you, de- you declared on Sesame Street, I think, that Oscar does have the dirtiest job, but... Dude, can I tell you what yeah. else? This is... I'm not bragging about this. In fact, it's shameful. In fact, I, I probably shouldn't even share it, but I was on Sesame Street in 2008. I was the first person to be invited into the <laughs> Oscar's garbage can. And I... This is so stupid. <laughs> but <laughs> before... Like we're 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 counting the garbage in his can, right? So it's a teachable moment. It's a math thing. And I'm outside his garbage can, and we're 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 riffing, and it's fun. And then the moment comes where Oscar invites me into the can. This never happened before. Did you go head first into the can? No, I exited, and <laughs> and then just popped up in the can. Uh. But, but before I left the frame, I asked Oscar that question. I'm like, uh, I said, well, how do I? How do I get in the can? I said, how do I get in the can? <laughs> and he says, oh, I just come on around through the back door. And then I said, oh, I've always wanted to go in the back door. <laughs> Ridiculous, childish, inappropriate. Nobody at PBS caught it. And, right. it, and it aired. And it aired. Okay, nice. So thousands of letters on It's like that Facebook. famous uh, scene on uh, like the, the newlywed game. It's like, where's the strangest place you've made whoopee? That right? would be They're in like, the butt. <laughs> Exactly. That's exactly what it was. I actually made a sodomy joke yeah. on Sesame Street, <laughs> and, it, and it made it in. So that so, probably is YouTubeable somewhere. Oh, it's there. Yeah, yeah. yeah of okay, course. Good. I'm going to do that after the show. It's all there. It's yeah. that's it's all there. Oh, that's great. Oh, wait. So, what is the dirtiest job? Well, early on in the show, we went to. West Side sewage treatment, wastewater treatment plant in San Francisco uh, to replace a ruptured lift pump. And a lift pump is a five pound motor, a five ton motor, really. It sits at the bottom of a, like a five story silo. And the pumping chamber fills up with raw sewage mm. over the course of the day. And the lift pump. Mm, and we have another sip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so the lift pump pushes the unfiltered, unprocessed sewage into like a fixed film reactor and it goes through a whole series of things that ultimately makes the water drinkable, believe it or not. But when that lift pump fails, the entire chain of command seizes up and the chamber begins to fill with everything that's flushed down the toilet. And alarms go off and men in woefully inadequate... (laughs) <laughs> Tyvek suits descend a series of spiral staircases and muscle their way through watertight doors and literally dog paddle to through. the ruptured pump. Oh, my God. Through it all. Through it all. Ugh. And then you climb on top of this glazed donut of fecal How disappointment. How do they not gag? Are there, is there anything over their nose or anything? Well, well they're, they're I mean, breathing it, it in. But it's, at that point, it doesn't matter. It's yeah. so you're, you're so subsumed Unreal. In, in all of it. And uh, basically, his job is to get on top of the four-ton motor, and a man operating a crane lowers a cable, and you cinch it off, and you hang on, and they hoist that whole thing up five stories. And the sound that a (laughs) ruptured lift pump makes when it breaks the seal of shit that's been holding it to the floor, that'll haunt your dreams. Yeah. Yeah. Were you there for one of those? I was on top of the lift pump. Oh my god! I was three stories up. I can't it... believe this is the technology for this. We, we haven't, with all the inventions we've made, we haven't designed something better. To... It's pretty great, man. I mean, it's a it's a pump that lives. I mean, you have to get it out and get it in. I don't know how else you you would do it. But what I remember most is being about thirty feet in the air, and seeing a turd the size of a like a Fiat slide off of this pump and fall all the way back down 
and my cameraman who was filming the ascent, you know, he's, he sees it coming. He's filming me. <laughs> and he just looks at it. And I just remember oh, no. him shaking his head like, he oh, no. <laughs> and it hits him like... <laughs> It's just devastating. <laughs> it knocks the camera out of his hand and just knocks him down into, oh, the, into the muck. And I had a camera in my hand, so I was able to sort of film it from my perspective, too. So, yeah, when, when you're filming yourself on a ruptured lift pump, being hoisted out of the pumping chamber and watching your cameraman drown in somebody else's oh, man. effluvia... Then, yeah, you that know. wins. This is why you're America's storyteller. You oh, took no, me thanks. there. I was, I was there with the turd. Uh, best decade ever in America to live. And you feel free to speculate about the decades that you did not personally experience. Oh, you're talking about Virchmaltz. You're talking about the yearning for a time you didn't actually inhabit. Is that the Woody Allen movie thing where they like yeah. To, yeah, yeah. Yep, exactly. I, uh, well, I mean, I would love to, I think if I had money, I mean, the Roaring Twenties would have been a blast. Pretty man. good. I yeah. think Gatsby. I, th I think that whole time coming, like, before the Great War and after, you know, I think there was a recession or a depression in the 1890s. No, that guy, it was after World War One, Right, after World War One. That Okay. Yeah, 19... Babe Ruth is out there yeah. hitting home runs. Yep, 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 yep. That'd be good. All right, I like it. Well, yeah, was the question live in the time or visit the time? Like, live, to live. Oh, no, screw Best it. Best time to live in America. I, believe it or not, right now. Right now. Yeah, and I'll tell you why. Um, Excedrin. Um, <laughs> Statins. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Painkillers of any kind. I mean, oh, my God. I just, I mean, can you imagine the surgeries? Just going to the dentist yeah. 100 years ago? Screw that, You know, that, I feel like man. in the 80s, we didn't have statins in the 80s, but we had penicillin. Things were pretty good. I, I feel like the 80s, I missed those a little bit. It, was, it seems simpler. We didn't have the technology. I, you know, I'm raising young kids. The technology is freaking me out a little bit. Yeah, well, you already it lived simpler. through it. I, I mean, I've got it, like 1,900 subscriptions to streaming <laughs> services. That I'm probably playing twice for at least a few of them. You know what? And a year from now, it's going to be like... Um, What's this podcast called again? Dedicated. Dedicated. Here, here look at that. Subscribe hey, now. That little thing up for Subscribe us. right now. Why? <laughs> Why? We we'll cut out all these annoying ads. Five ninety nine a month. Doug that's that's my next move. We're going subscription <laughs> behind the paywall. <laughs> oh, God. All right. So right now, I like that answer. I, hopefully, I'll get to that mental place soon. Best product ever sold on QVC. By me. By well, you and. But either way, any way you want. Well, I'm your guest. Screw those other guys. Let's keep it about me if we could. <laughs> um, I, I, there was a moment of like just sublime intersectionality with absurdity and 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 commerce. About I was probably there three or four months. Oh, my God, I could tell you about a collectible doll incident. <laughs> That's that. That's too long. I'm going to say there was a thing <laughs> called a cat sack, okay? And I mention this because if there's anybody still listening and you want to Google it, you can actually see it. It's it's one of those things that people posted on YouTube years after the fact that left me no choice but to admit that it happened, even though I didn't remember it happening. It it happened, and a cat sack is basically um, a grocery bag lined with mylar and uh what you do doug is you take the cat sack and you put it on your floor and then you invite your cat to crawl into the sack and when your cat <laughs> when your cat crawls into the cat sack <laughs> it, it starts to crinkle and it makes a crinkling the sound the, the sack the sack begins to crinkle and the crinkling sound, according to studies, right, um, <laughs> so fills the feline with unbridled joy that it doesn't know what to do except spin around, causing more crinkling. So when your cat goes into the cat sack and begins to twirl and spin and roll about, you've brought a level of um, enlightenment and self-actualization to your cat. That you're just never ever going to be able to do with any other kind of. It cat sounds like toy. a never-ending cycle of excitement, like more crinkling, more spinning. How Builds do you get the cat itself. out of the cat sack? Unclear. 
it's, it's unclear. I suspect you could pick the whole thing up and walk off with your cat. Or you could just leave the room and leave the cat and its sack yeah. to pursue a life of religious fulfillment. <laughs> or I don't, I don't really know how it ends. And look, all these questions were posed by me during the sale of this thing. You had eight minutes? How many minutes did you have for the cat sack? Well, interminable. I mean, <laughs> it, 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 time stops. There's no... Another time warp. It's like t the time-space continuum completely collapses on itself, and you're just left Do you there. get data on how many sell? Are you getting oh, yeah. real-time? Real-time no, data. Yeah, so you can see, like, as you're doing it, you can see whether it's working. I had two IFBs, right? That's it. IFB, is, it's just the earpiece. It stands for... Um, interruptible fold back right and if you have one in your right ear uh that's the thing you can take a live phone call on mm. all right that allows you to talk to the viewer the one in your left ear the producer or the director can just torment you with all sorts of information you don't want to hear about they can just mess with you which we did remorselessly with one another but that's the one that they'll tell you uh the phones are really exploding in the northeast Right, so whatever you're doing is like really working it's in New working. England. Uh, the South isn't buying any of this. And the next thing you know, you're talking like Foghorn Leghorn <laughs> because <laughs> you're trying to do whatever you can to appeal to the most folks, you see. So it, it was ridiculous. We were constantly on the head of a pin, constantly trying to That's figure amazing. out. That's amazing. I didn't realize it was that engineered. Imagine talking to a viewer in one ear, listening to a producer who you hate, with the white hot intensity of a thousand suns mm. telling you what to do and not do in the other ear. While, Is the hate reciprocated? Producer also hates you? Ah, it was good natured hate. You know, I mean, we were all pretty <laughs> liquored up at that point. I mean, it was the middle of the night. But in the middle of it, there you are alone on a set with a cat sack trying to make sense of the world, as you understand it, <laughs> trying, to, trying to sell a garbage bag lined with mylar. You know, for two easy payments of fourteen ninety nine. That's amazing. How hokey. I'm gonna see if the cat sack is I am gonna YouTube all of this, by it's the way. There. There's like nine it's things a, I need to it's there. YouTube after this. All right, we're down to our final two questions here. Best song to perform as a barbershop quartet. Good lord. Well, I mean I can't answer it, uh, because the the joy of that is well, who are you singing with, you know, because so much of that hobby involves singing in four part harmony with strangers, because a lot of people know the same songs in that weird little world. And when you run into three people you don't know, you got a chance Does that to get... happen. You like you just it strike up with three strangers time. and start singing. Well, remember, like you're at a barbershop convention, you're at a I big see. competition. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So there are, you know, 5000 people there, it's just, but it doesn't happen at like Starbucks. In Santa it's Monica. Happened. Oh, no. I mean, that, that'd be weird. I mean, <laughs> it could happen. Hey, you, you, and you. Come over here. <laughs> I, was, I, I, I was in uh, Ocean City, Maryland one time. There was a convention there, and it was about 2 in the morning. And I was headed back to my room, and I was taking the stairs. And I heard some people singing in the stairwell. Stairwells are a great mm. place to acoustics sing. Acoustics are good. The acoustics are great, and you're not tormenting people who are trying to sleep <laughs> right so you're so you're sort of in a safe place and uh there were four guys singing and the bass left he had to go and i sing bass and uh, so these three guys are there one of them they must be like holy shit we sang with mike rowe it was amazing dude i was like 25 oh you were i wasn't mike rowe <laughs> I was just a, 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 I, I was a recently stammering hot mess with a, a big Adam's apple who was just trying to figure things out. Like Clint Eastwood, he became a star despite the Adam's apple. The mayor of Ocean City was singing lead. Uh, the baritone, I learned later, was a guy who had all kinds of decorations for flying in the Korean War. And the tenor was the CEO of, like, Accenture or some big accounting firm. Oh my firm. gosh. Like what, utterly random. And me. And we sang a song in that stairwell. And the song was called, uh, it was an old Irish song called That Tumble Down Shack. And um, it, it could have been any song, it, it wouldn't have mattered. But ringing those chords with three dudes who had all done well in their life in really different ways, you know, to be a kid and to be 
pulled into mm-hmm. that strange. It's so strange, dog. It's just so those moments in strange. life that stick out to you. Have you reconnected with any of those three nope. in life ever since? Nope. I mean, they're out there. You should find them. That they're was, out it sounds there. Sounds like it's yeah. one of your moments. I mean, it was a long time ago. I mean, I, I don't know if they're still out there or not. But I mean, it's that 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 is a moment, mm. right? It's and and you don't really know it when it's happening, but when you look back at it, it's. It's a heck of a thing, man. Oh, it's, cool. it's, it's again, it's storytelling through music and mm-hmm. fellowship. Mm-hmm. That Fred King guy I mentioned, he, you know, he was so beloved in that world and so respected as a musician. But one day he said in an interview that I saw him, and he said, "It's the, uh, you know, people talk a lot about the fellowship of this community and this chorus and the fellowship and a quartet and 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 all of it, but the music." doesn't make the fellowship the fellowship makes the music Mm. and i think that's what he was talking about if you can if you can sit down with somebody you don't really know and form a communion if you can sit down and sing with people you've never met around a song that you all happen to know right the 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 hold is greater than the sum of its parts is fred king still alive nope he would love this book he features prominently in the book he does he um he died uh, on Labor Day, the day I launched the Microworks Foundation. Labor Day of? 2008. 2008, okay. Yeah. 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 That's funny you say that, man. Gosh, it's just, it's such a, uh, it's such a crooked road mm. for all of us, really. All right, well, that leads us to our, our final question. One piece of advice for the listeners on any, any topic. you got to be kidding. Really? All right. <laughs> no, no, I can't. It's the thing that scares me most, man. I, I, I don't know who's listening. Like if I talk about college or, uh, two, or trade schools, or I have no idea what people need to hear at any point in time. I, I, I think maybe part of... Part That's of, very humble of you, by the way, to, to have that reaction, you know? Well, I, I, I... Or... People are dying for advice from you on anything. Well, I mean, let me think real like um I, I i don't think anything bad can happen from encouraging people to um to be uncomfortable you know to i mean it was it uncom- it's uncomfortable to write a book this chair is uncomfortable this chair right now i <laughs> i really wish i'd worn several <laughs> pairs of underpants to be honest it's sweaty I don't think it's real leather. <laughs> it's definitely not real leather. It's not. But, you know, given my spills with the bourbon, that's good. <laughs> it's not the itching. It's the chafing. <laughs> um, no, I think uh, I'll go back to Frost, you know. I, it's, if, you can, if you can find a way to do a thing that needs to be done and then learn to love it, you win. If you love mm. a thing that needs to be done and you can do it, you win. Uh, I think maybe the great struggle is to is to crack that code in whatever your vocation or your avocation is Mm -hmm. you get to figure it out and i don't know how much time you have to do it some people spend 90 years and they and they don't some people just seem to luck right into it i hate those people obviously (laughs) Those Jack are all Carr, we're looking Jack at Carr. you. Jack Carr. Oh, he only gave his life, you know, up and, you know. Yeah, th- but man, he knew he was going to. Not gave it, he risked it. He certainly risked <laughs> it. So the only two things I ever wanted to do was be a Navy SEAL and write best-selling books. Boom and boom. Well, screw you, Jack Carr, <laughs> and your whiskey. <laughs> well, man, good for him. You know, they're out there. And, yeah. and, and look, but that's why the advice is tricky, because you can find a guy like Jack and you can say, see what you do. If you can sit down and if you can target Set it. Set your mind to it. Go yeah. for it. doesn't you, always work that way. No, because one of the great truths in life is just because you love something doesn't mean you can't suck at it. Mm-hmm. And, you know. Nor does it mean you even have the opportunity to do it. Like, people need to put food on the table. You can't just say, I want to be this. It's like, well, that's not really going to pay, at least for like 30 years. Like, you've got responsibilities. You can't do what you love. Do I what mean, you love is... Look, not always takeable advice. Well, it's, I mean, not to turn this into a whole Joe Rogan extravaganza, but the short version is, like, the, the best thing that happened at Dirty Jobs was, like, lessons from the dirt. 
this alternative way of living emerged and it challenged conventional wisdom, or at least it gave me a chance to. And so to, to debunk a bromide, to, to challenge the idea, for instance, that we should always follow our passion, that's now become just, that's what we tell our kids. You know, you want to be happy? What are you passionate about? All right, how, how can we get that passion realized? And then you're down a road. Mm -hmm. You're down a road to borrowing mm -hmm. whatever it takes and to getting into the right school and so forth and so on. And then maybe when you get all your credentials in line and maybe when all of that works out for you, maybe then you'll get the job or you'll find the, the mate or you'll do whatever has to happen that will allow you to be happy. And so I don't, I don't think that's really the smartest way to go about job satisfaction or just happiness in general. Mm -hmm. look for the opportunities maybe they don't feel like the thing you're supposed to be doing i know this is true of writers i know my mom wrote every day for 60 years wow before she got published wow every day doug every day for 60 years what a triumph at 80 and that she had a best-selling book at 80 awesome first book right so i i don't you know i i was just talking to my mom about this it's like what do you tell people like when you want to encourage a writer to write and you know that most writers are never going to make it, what do you do? Like, that's why I don't, people ask me every day, Hey, I told him got a pretty good voice. How do I do this voiceover thing? Like, are you kidding me? I, you're not going to make it. I don't think the odds are so far against you. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know when encouragement becomes, um, enabling right misleading right yeah i, I, I have yeah. I, I have no idea yeah but i but i do know that once upon a time fred king told me something i needed to hear and uh I, I i don't know if it was wisdom or serendipity that he told me at just the right time but it changed everything mm -hmm. you got to find that that moment that person i guess i just don't know that you can do it in the present and i don't know that i i know you can't script it and, and if all else fails, of course, you can just find the Nobel whiskey. So we'll just bring it full circle. Why, why wouldn't we? Noblespirits.com. Every time you buy a bottle online, it benefits the MicroWorks Foundation. Whole new line of, listen to me, plugging the heck out of this. Whole new line of work ethic scholarships. $1 million available at microworks.org if you want to learn a skill that's in demand. All right, then. Awesome. Cheers. Hey, thank you for having me on. This <laughs> is great. Thank you so much. It's so fun. Uh, you know, it's a shame we really couldn't just stretch it out into a... <laughs> How long have we been talking, Mary? What, 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 what's the over-under on this? Uh, two hours. Two hours. It's not bad. You're, you're our longest. Look at that. Cheers. Cheers. Great to see you.